sources, social media, or do any type of independent investigation. Did each of you adhere to the court's admonitions thus far? Did anyone try to speak to you about the case? No. Did you speak to anyone about the case? No. Are all 12 of you, plus our four alternates, ready to proceed? Yes. Okay. And at this time, I would ask that each of you stand and please raise your right hand. Ladies and gentlemen, do you solemnly swear or affirm that in the case now for trial, you will well and truly try the issues joined and a true verdict render according to the law and the evidence, so help you God. Thank you, and please be seated. As I have told you before the lunch break, at all times, from the time that you leave your car until you come to the courtroom, and any time you're in the building, you must keep your juror badge on at all times to identify you as a juror. Um, you will be, have been provided a notebook for your alternates that are down there at the corner. I will um, explain to you how to handle the notebooks and the taking of notes uh, later. Um, you will have access to a telephone on the breaks, and I believe that Ms. Graves and Mr. Hatcher have already given you a brief um, orientation about how that's going to work. Before we begin the trial, I would like to tell you a little bit about what will happen during the course of these proceedings. I'm basically going to describe how the trial will be conducted and what the attorneys, jurors, and I will do over the course of this trial. At the end of the trial, I will give you more detailed instructions on how you are going to go about reaching your decision. Now, I simply want to give you a brief explanation of how the trial is going to proceed. The defendant has been charged by the state of Tennessee with a violation of state law. The document containing the charge is referred to as an indictment. An indictment is the formal written accusation charging a defendant with a crime and is not evidence of anything. The defendant, Sean Patrick Foley, in case number 26264, is charged in the indictment with the crime of premeditated first degree murder. The defendant has pled not guilty to the charge. He is presumed innocent and may not be found guilty by you unless after hearing all of the evidence, the attorney's arguments, and instructions of law, the 12 jurors seated in this case unanimously find that the state has proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt. This is the first step in the trial will be the attorney's opening statements. The state will tell you about the evidence it intends to present so that you will have an idea about what the state's case is about. This opening statement is not evidence. Its only purpose is to help you understand what the evidence will be and what the state will attempt to prove. After the state's opening statement, an attorney for the defendant may make an opening statement if he chooses to do so. Again, statements of the attorneys are not evidence. Next will be the state's case in chief, in which the state will present its evidence. The evidence in this case will most likely consist of physical exhibits, documents, and the testimony of witnesses. The witnesses will testify by answering questions asked by the attorneys. After the state completes its case in chief, the defense will be given an opportunity to present evidence through witnesses and exhibits. A defendant is not required to put on any evidence or to testify. The burden is always on the state to convince you that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If the defense does put, uh, present proof, the state may then put on what is known as rebuttal proof. After the state's rebuttal, the defense may, be, may put on further proof. After you have heard all the evidence, the state and the defense may present final arguments. I previously told you that opening statements by the attorneys are not evidence. Likewise, closing arguments are not evidence. In closing arguments, the parties will attempt to summarize their cases and help you understand the law or the evidence that was presented. The final part of the trial occurs when I instruct you about the rules of the law that you are to use in reaching your verdict. Definitions of legal terms and propositions will be given to you. Also, you will be instructed as to how to deliberate and consider the evidence. The entire typed instruction will be available to you for your review in the jury room. After you hear my instructions, I will excuse the alternate jurors, and the final 12 jurors will leave the courtroom together as a group. 
You will then begin your deliberations to make a decision in this case. Your deliberations will be secret, and you will not be required to explain your verdict to anyone. Now that I have described an outline form of the trial itself, let me explain the functions that you and I will perform during this trial. I will decide which rules of law apply to the case. My decisions will be reflected in responses to questions and objections the attorneys raised during the trial, as well as my final typed instructions to you. It is your job to determine what the facts are from the evidence. You must then apply the law and my instructions to the facts, and from that application you will arrive at your verdict. The state has the burden of proving the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt, and this burden remains on the state of Tennessee throughout the entire case. Keep in mind the defendant is presumed innocent of the charges against him. Thus, the defendant is not required to prove his innocence, to have his attorney make any statements or arguments, or to produce any evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, I am now going to charge you as to the state's burden of proof, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. I will charge you again with this instruction at the end of the trial. Reasonable doubt is the doubt engendered by an investigation of all the proof in the case and an inability, after such investigation, to let the mind rest easily as to the certainty of guilt. Reasonable doubt does not mean a doubt that may arise from possibility. Absolute certainty of guilt is not demanded by the law to convict of any criminal charge, but moral certainty is required, and this certainty is required as to every proposition of proof requisite to constitute the offense. You as jurors must decide whether the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant has committed the crime charged in the indictment. You must consider, consider the evidence and base that decision only on, that evidence in, on the evidence in this case and my instructions about the law. An important part of your job will be making judgments about the testimony of witnesses who testify. You should decide whether you believe what each person says and the importance of his or her testimony. In making that decision, I suggest that you ask yourself a few questions. Did the person impress you as honest? Did he or she have any particular reason not to tell the truth? Did he or she have a personal outcome in the, or personal interest in the outcome of this case? Did the witness seem to have a memory of the events that he or she testified about? Did the witness have an opportunity and ability to observe accurately the things that he or she testified about? Did he or she appear to understand the questions clearly and answer them directly? Did a witness's testimony differ from the testimony of other witnesses? These are just a few considerations that will help you determine the accuracy of each witness's testimony. In making up your mind and reaching a verdict, do not base any decisions on the fact that there were more witnesses on one side than the other. Likewise, do not reach a conclusion on a particular point just because more witnesses testified for one side on that point. Your job is to think about the testimony of each witness you hear and decide the facts. Some of you have probably heard the terms circumstantial and direct evidence. These are the two basic type of evidence that exist in the law. Direct evidence is direct proof of a fact, such as the testimony of an eyewitness. Circumstantial evidence is proof of facts from which you may infer or conclude <coughs> that other facts exist. I will give you further instructions on these as well as other matters at the end of the case. Keep in mind that you may consider both kinds of evidence which are considered to be equal value um, in the law. The court will not provide you with a transcript of the testimony at the end of this trial. Therefore, you must listen very carefully to the testimony. Each of you will be allowed to take notes during the trial for your own use during deliberations. You are not required to take notes. You may take notes only of verbal testimony from witnesses, including witnesses presented by deposition or video. You may not take notes during the opening statements or closing arguments, or take notes on objections made to evidence. You may not take your notes during, may not take any notes during the breaks or recesses. Notes may only be made in open court while the witnesses are testifying. Your notes should not contain personal reactions or comments, but rather be limited to a brief factual summary of testimony that you think is important. Please do not let your note-taking distract you and cause you to miss what the witness says or how the witness said it. Remember that some testimony may not appear to be important to you at the time. That same testimony, however, may become important later in the trial. Your notes are not evidence. You should not view your notes as authoritative records or consider them as a transcript of the testimony. 
Your notes may be incomplete or contain errors and are not an exact account of what was said by a witness. Notes taken are for the use of the individual juror. The mere fact that one juror has written down a particular fact does not mean that that writing has more weight than the recollection or of the notes taken by the other jurors. In other words, a juror taking notes is not a reporter for the other jurors. You will have access to your notes during the recesses and deliberations. However, you will not be allowed to take your notes home with you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, during this trial, you will have testimony from various witnesses. If, after the witness has completed testifying, you would like to ask the witness a question, you may do so under the following conditions. You should write the question on a blank sheet of paper, which they are provided for you in, on the bar. Um, fold the paper and then hand it to the court officer who will give it to me. Your questions should be anonymous. Please do not sign it in any way or indicate that it is your question. I will decide whether to ask the witness all or part of your question. For reasons that you not need to be concerned with, I may decide not to ask a witness a juror's question or ask only part of the question. Please do not be offended or even bothered if this happens. It may have nothing to do with the quality of the question. The law is quite complex and contains many technical rules that the lawyers and I must follow. Sometimes one of your questions may deal with topics or be phrased in a way that the law does not allow it to be a part of this trial. Or perhaps the question deals with a topic that will be covered later in the proceeding. Accordingly, if I do not ask all or part of your question, or if I change the wording of the question, please do not draw any inference from this decision, which may be based upon legal principles that I must follow or the facts that are not part of this trial. Do not hold my decision against either party in this case. During the course of the trial, you should not talk with any witness, defendant, or attorney involved in the case. Please do not talk with them about any subject whatsoever. You may see them in the hallway, on an elevator, or in some other location. If you do, perhaps the best standing rule is to not say anything at all. The lawyers know that they are not supposed to speak with you. Therefore, please do not think they are being rude uh, when, if they see you in the hallway. You also should not discuss this case among yourselves until I instruct you on the law and you start deliberating at the end of this case. It is important that you wait until all of the evidence is received and you have heard all of the instructions on the rules of law before you deliberate among yourselves. During the course of the trial, you will receive all of the evidence you may properly consider to decide the case. Because of this, you should not attempt to do any research on your own or gather any information on your own that you think might be helpful. Do not engage in any outside reading, visit any places mentioned in this case, or try to learn about the case outside of this courtroom in any other manner. I do not know if there will be, well, there may be media reports in uh, newspapers or on television about this particular case. If there are, you are not permitted to read, watch, or listen to those reports. You as jurors must base your decision solely on the evidence that you hear in this courtroom. Every time that I bring you back into the courtroom from a break or from a recess, I'm going to ask you the same questions that I did every time. Did you consult any outside sources? Have you received any information whatsoever? And you need to be able to answer those questions affirmatively that you have not. It's very important. Um, at the end of the day, when you go home, as I told you earlier, do not discuss with family members the subject or the trial. You can merely tell people that you've been seated on a jury, and that's the only information that you can give. At times during the trial, an attorney may make an objection to a question that is asked by another attorney or to an answer that a witness gives. This simply means that the attorney is requesting that I make a decision on a particular rule of law. Do not draw any conclusions from the fact that an objection was made or from any ruling on that objection. My rulings only relate to the legal questions that I must determine and should not influence your thinking. If I sustain an objection to a question, the witness will not be permitted to answer the question. Do not attempt to guess what the answer might have been had the witness been permitted to give it. Also, if I tell you not to consider a particular statement that was made, you should put that statement out of your mind and you may not refer to that statement later in your deliberations. Finally, during the course of the trial, I may have to interrupt the proceedings to confer with the attorneys about the rules of law that should apply. In some cases, we may have bench conferences. You saw a little bit of that this morning during a jury selection. Um, at other times, I may have to send you back into the jury room while we work on jury instructions or other legal issues. 
uh, please understand that we will try to avoid these interruptions, but they are necessary. Um, I ask for your patience, and please understand that in the long run, they actually do save us time <clears throat> so that we may deal with these issues. If after you find, after your deliberations, you find the defendant guilty, the court will set the punishment at a separate sentencing hearing. The jury will not be involved in setting the punishment. If at any time during the course of the trial you need to take a break, please let the court, uh, court officers know other questions that you may have relative to any other matter um, other than the trial itself. Obviously, you've met Mr. Hatcher, Ms. Graves, um, the court officers, and they will be able to assist you. That does complete my opening comments to you. For the purposes of the record, is the rule for the separate reception of evidence is that requested? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so if there are any witnesses in the courtroom, you must remain outside until you are called to testify and you may not discuss your testimony with anyone. We will now proceed to the reading of the indictment. Circuit Court, State of Tennessee, Blount County. The grand jurors of Blount County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath, present that Sean Patrick Foley, on or about the 28th day of August 2018 in Blount County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, unlawfully, intentionally, and with premeditation, did kill Jimmy L. Shelton in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated 39-13-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. A true bill being returned January 7, 2019. How does the defendant plead to the indictment? Not guilty, Your Honor. Does the state of Tennessee have an opening statement? We do, Your Honor. You may proceed. Thank you. 